everyone, and welcome to the Meaningful Money Making Show. We have an awesome guest today. His name is Mark Adams. Let me read you his bio really quick. He's a lifestyle celebrant accredited by Humanist UK. He has a background in fiction writing, sports emceeing, and radio presenting, but he spent the majority of his working life before coming a celebrant as a PA and a librarian. He's had a very interesting life. Uh, he specializes in writing and presenting personalized naming ceremonies to welcome a new baby into the world, bespoke wedding ceremonies to suit any couple, and unique funeral ceremonies to offer a personal and meaningful goodbye. He also has a podcast called Life's My Milestones based on his job where he interviews a different guest each episode about naming ceremonies, weddings, and funerals. He lives in Manchester, England with his partner and their cat, Pasha. Mark, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. That was a very um, complete bio. Um, yeah. <laughs> thanks very much. And the interview's done. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice getting to know you. Okay, so I have to ask before I get in, into any of my interview questions, do you at any time during your any of your ceremonies use like your MC voice? Does it ever sound like a movie announcer is doing a ceremony? If the couple want that, of course, why not? <laughs> have you ever do. done that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I probably, when you've got like the start of a ceremony and you're getting everybody into place, I think sometimes the kind of push out your chest and do a bit of wrestling yeah. announcing is possibly something that I might have <laughs> naturally gone into, but maybe not deliberately. <laughs> so you don't ever start a wedding with, let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> like I say, I'm not above it, but no, not right. yet. I, do, I would like okay. to do a um, kind of boxing or wrestling uh, show wedding combo that would be perfect for me I think that would be pretty amazing if you do that <laughs> even in like jest I need to see it so you need to send us the link and I'll put it in this video <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into your business a little bit tell us a little bit about what you do nowadays well I'm a humanist life cycle celebrant which means that I do naming ceremonies, wedding ceremonies and funerals and other ceremonies for non-religious folk. And um, mm. yeah, that's my full time job, which a few years ago, I, I don't think I'd have um, really thought that that would be a thing. <laughs> so a few years ago, just out of curiosity, what did you think you would be doing right now? Probably managing the library. I think at the mm -hmm. time I was working in a library and I quite liked working in a library and it was time to maybe start thinking about moving on because I've been doing it a while and why wouldn't I want to move up to managing a library? Never got there in the end, decided to do this. Mm -hmm. I imagine there's a fairly, I mean, I guess there's probably more prestigious libraries than others, but there's not like a really lofty career ladder in the library sciences, most likely, or am no, I wrong? No, but I think the, particularly in Manchester where I live, the mm -hmm. first library in Britain, the John Rylands Library, it nice. would be a particularly prestigious one to go and work for, I think. Yeah, that would be awesome. So as a humanist celebrant and in other things that you do in your life nowadays, what's the most meaningful thing you find yourself doing? I think when, when I started up being a celebrant, I, in my, in my head, I had the idea of being a wedding celebrant that did naming ceremonies and funerals. With the current situation, weddings aren't really feasible for more than, well, they're not, they're illegal for more than 15 people in Britain. Mm -hmm. And people don't want a wedding with 15 people. So they've yeah. tended to postpone or um, go with a much smaller scale version of what they were planning on doing. So I've done a lot more funerals than I was expecting or maybe even wanting to do. And yeah. the responsibility of putting the full stop and expressing the family's wishes to everybody and making sure that your ceremony is a brilliant way to say goodbye to someone rather than a boring way or a a way that's not personal to the people in attendance that's a huge responsibility that perhaps 10 years ago 15 years ago 
that wouldn't have been right for me mm-hmm. at the time. I, I was, you know, I was busy drinking too much alcohol and going night clubbing, you know. Whereas yeah. now, uh, in my early forties, that really does give my life meaning. And I think, mm-hmm. again, it's possibly an element of being a humanist that because we believe it's the only life you get Mm -hmm. that you have to make sure that you leave your mark in the right way the other thing that I might highlight that I do that is completely outside of my job that gives my life meaning is handing back to the next generation I'm a scout leader and I um on a weekly basis I spend time with other people's children teaching them how to uh tie knots and uh, make fires without matches and that sort of thing. And um, I feel like your legacy is all that you can leave behind because that's Mm. what I believe as a humanist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Is it difficult to, I mean, you have such like highlight positive things that you do with the naming ceremonies and the weddings. And then you have such a emotionally heavy thing you do with the funerals is it tough to like find a balance and be able to bring the same amount of like yourself and emotion and and connection to both of those things or is it something that comes naturally to you I think you've pretty much hit it right you know hit the hammer right on the head there because they are so completely different and um that's part of the reason why I felt like I would be a wedding celebrant that did funerals you know Mm-hmm. Because I thought that I was better suited to the happy stuff, the uh, the namings and the weddings and the um, smiley, smiley joy times in your life. Mm-hmm. But no, I, I feel like you can find silver linings in what's happened over the last nearly 12 months now. And one of them is that I surprise myself that I get a lot of um, personal gratification out of the fact that when you know you've done a good job for a family in a funeral it's obviously it's not the same kind of adrenaline as you might have Mm -hmm. for doing a good job for a wedding but if I'll be blunt it feels great knowing that you've done as good a job as anyone could have done or a better job than the family were expecting for someone's funeral and you've made it memorable and you've helped somebody to start their healing process from their grief in a way that perhaps another type of ceremony another type of ceremony might not have actually done for them you know yeah you know i wonder if there's like a a different level of of gravity to the funerals that the the people in that the people can't do it themselves like a wedding you know you can get a in the United States at least sometimes you can get like some mail order certificate that you know certifies you as a wedding officiant in a lot of states and it's there's not like you don't have to be trained necessarily and so like mm. your dad could do it or your grandpa could do it and a naming ceremony like same thing but like in a funeral everyone's like really emotional and really tore up and they don't know really what to say and they don't know the whole process that maybe like having somebody like you to be a rock that the ceremony can kind of like revolve around and you can just make it easier for everyone is perhaps maybe one of the more valuable of the options that you offer for that emotional reason. I I think you're right. And um, I remember losing my temper a little with someone who, when I was a wrestling ring announcer, she said to me, anybody can ring announce. And I, I raised an eyebrow and I said, anybody can ring announce, but not everybody can ring announce well. Yes. And um, I've taken that with me and kind of like yeah and I understand that you might want your your best mate to do it and that is absolutely um what you're right as you your wedding is the most important day of your life a lot of people say but I think yeah um it can be easier with someone that you can form a new relationship with you can they don't come with any kind of baggage yeah. and I th- yeah, I, I I do believe that a celebrant is the best choice, but obviously I would. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I, I do think that there's a significant value in having somebody who's done it before, knows what they're doing, knows how to say the right things and keep the mood right without letting it go too low, but like obviously mm. not making light of the situation either and, and just kind of maintaining that 
that right feeling for things. So yeah. talk to me about getting into being a, a lifestyle celebrant or a life cycle celebrant, excuse me. Um, why did you pick life cycle celebrant as opposed to a different way to get into being official to celebrate things for people? Okay, so life cycle celebrant is a term that only some celebrants will use. It just means that you do all three ceremonies. So naming mm. ceremonies, wedding ceremonies and funeral ceremonies. Mm. And within Humanists UK, the people who I'm accredited by, that those are the three ceremonies that you have major training in. And um, so Humanist Celebrant is the job title. Life Cycle Celebrant is kind of like um, stylistic choice that I've chosen, but not all celebrants who are um, trained in all three ceremonies will we'll use that term. I just really like it because I think it has a nice kind of natural feel to it, a nice kind of, and it, it it's a really nice way of putting the fact that you can do all three ceremonies. So, um, and the way I got into it was not dissimilar to the way I was talking about before, where you ask a friend to officiate your wedding. <laughs> Friends of mine asked uh -huh. me to officiate their wedding and I said, okay, I'll do it, but I'm going to do it right. Mm. So I looked into um, training, not just from Humanist UK, through other celebrant um, accreditation ways in this country, because Humanist UK, as far as, again, I'm, I would say this, but as far as I'm concerned, has the best training and has the most um, comprehensive training. But beyond that, I am humanist and I it's an important part of my identity as 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 Mark is that mm -hmm. I am a humanist. And um, so I got trained in weddings just to do this uh, this wedding for my friends. And I didn't really know how far that was going to go. I didn't know whether I would want to do um, naming ceremonies or more 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 importantly, whether I would want to do funerals. Mm. But I just loved doing the weddings after my friend's wedding I obviously did a few more weddings for other people that weren't personal friends and I just loved it so much that it just felt like the next right step would be to get the other strings to my bow so I could potentially look at making it my full-time job rather than just doing weddings at the weekend working in a library during the week you know right yeah, it's it seems like a nice career that, especially as a librarian, it'd be easy to balance with a full time job and then kind of easing into it on the Absolutely. side on the weekends. A lot nice. of celebrants in this country do that. They, I know one celebrant, for example, he's a teacher. There's no way he mm. could be a funeral celebrant because you, he's at school all the time when you would have yeah. a funeral. But he's he has no interest in being a life cycle celebrant. He just wants to be do some weddings at the weekend, aren't they lovely? And good for him because th that is the flexibility when it comes to a job like being a celebrant. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So tell us, I mean, we we joked about using your MC voice at a, at a celebration, but talk to us about like, the you, know, you can change the names to protect the guilty, but what's the most unusual uh, celebration you've ever done? <laughs> I do have a favorite story that... Um, yeah, I will share with you. This couple, they were my first couple that weren't my friends. Mm. And um, it's very rare that you get um, a a wedding abroad because the, the couple have to pay for your travel and everything like that. But my my first wedding outside of the friends that originally asked me to, to, to do their ceremony was in um, Milan in Italy. Nice. And um, this couple had very much gone the whole hog. They had been planning this wedding for a year before they even brought in a celebrant. So they knew what they wanted. And what they wanted was, still to this day, probably the most elaborate ceremony I've ever done. There were three readings followed by three um, musical interludes live on a piano outside and um, they had a hand fasting, which I can explain a little bit. But they they also had a reading and they had an owl. They had an owl. They wanted the owl to deliver the rings. 
And um, okay. so, yeah. So the best man had a the the leather glove. I'm not sure whether there's a term for it, but yes. you know the, the the ostler. Is it an ostler? What are they called? Falconer. A falconer's glove. Yes. Ostler's horses. <laughs> falconer's glove. I didn't know that. I I knew the falconer, but I didn't know that you said ostler. So I I learned no, something today. No, it's definitely not an ostler. You don't want, you don't want a horse landing on your hand. No. Um, <laughs> But no, this. Um, so he had this falconer's glove in his pocket. And the joke was, I would ask the best man for the ring, and he'd do. Yeah. And pull out this glove. So he did all that. The practice went great. Everything worked. And the idea was, hold out your glove. Owl lands on your hand. And the owl's got a little box with the rings in, which he would then pass to the celebrant. Lovely. Right. Everybody gets to see an owl. Spectacular element part of the... Uh, the ceremony, unforgettable memories. Yes. The owl didn't like the crowd. Oh, no. And so he did all his dramatics, put his glove on, held it out. Owl landed on his hand. He went like this towards the owl for the box. The owl oh, no. panicked and flew away. Oh, landed, no. <laughs> landed at this gigantic tree. It must have been 20 foot in the air. <laughs> and then... Um, we all looked round and we were like, um, right? So this fella, the the best man, in his suit with his, you know, his, his, his posh outfit, had to chase after this owl, chuck sticks at the tree to oh get the owl goodness. out of the tree. Meanwhile, the owl had kicked the little box off, so it was in the tree. Oh, no. So the... the <laughs> The actual falconer collected the, the owl, but this meth man had to chuck sticks at the tree to knock the box out <laughs> and bring it back to me. And in my head, I was like, should I go and help this guy? Right? No one's going to help this guy. <laughs> but, I, 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 you know, it's my, my first real gig. And right. I was like, uh, right. uh, <laughs> and, and every <laughs> second. I'm here to celebrate. Not get rings out of trees. And every second we were waiting for this guy to get these rings back. The, the, the bride yeah. was like, oh. The groom was like, oh. And the, the, the crowd were laughing. And, and that's yeah. the thing. The whole point was it was supposed to be a memory, a spectacle that everybody remembered about their wedding. Yes, never to it be wasn't, duplicated. It wasn't what they expected, but it was definitely no. something that everyone would remember about their wedding. Yes. Yeah, I think it makes a better story to tell the grandkids now. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So the moral of the story then is don't rely on an owl to, to deliver anything in a big crowd. They say never work with animals or children. I really like animals. I really like kids. But um, I think kids are better and easier <laughs> to manage than a, than a frightened owl. Yes, and and if kids don't do what they're supposed to do when they're little, it's just cute and adorable. Whereas the owl could be highly problematic for a lot of different reasons. <laughs> and and knew the owl afterwards. She was very lovely. She accepted strokes and fuss from everybody. She she did redeem herself afterwards. Nice. Oh, she she stayed for like the reception then. She did. I got to meet Anya afterwards, and she was lovely. That's fun. <laughs> So ceremonies used to be like a major part of human culture and like the transition from childhood to adulthood and marriage and then like, you know, coming of like becoming an elder in one society. And it seems like a lot of ritual and celebrations and that sort of thing has kind of fallen by the wayside. Uh, talk to us about how you feel about those sorts of things. I think the ones we've retained are the most important ones and always were. So, you know, there's a reason for the name Life Cycle Celebrant is that you start at the beginning, then you have the middle bit, and then you have the finality of the end. And I think those three ceremonies will always be the most important ones. And anything else that you want to make into a ceremony, someone like me is, is perfect for that because we are retaining a fundamental human need for ceremony and celebration of certain, and I'm going to say it, certain milestones in people's lives. And um, I think 
we'll never ever lose that there are some things that we might only have in britain like for example the harvest festival which is um i think it's originally pagan the idea being that you thank nature for your autumn harvest and that sort of thing and that's particularly in schools something that still remains with us in britain which i really like you bring in some fruit veg um tin goods and it's almost like a charity based drive based around an old festival which i think's lovely nice. yeah. at least i say we still do it i'm assuming we still do it i'm 42 we did it when i was in <laughs> school in the 80s anyway uh, but, um, for a little while <laughs> yeah but it was lovely but i don't think outside of britain the harvest festival is a particularly popular concept but you know you've recently had thanksgiving and yes. i like the idea of it but we just don't do that in britain at all yeah yeah no here usually harvest festival is something that churches use to describe their version of halloween because they don't want to use the word halloween because of its pagan Congrats. roots and so it's like a, <laughs> a way to have halloween without calling it that Halloween is much, much more popular in the States than it is over here, but we are catching up. We are definitely right? catching up. I'm a but massive horror out. film fan, so nice. I love Halloween. Nice. My birthday is the day after Halloween, and so I, I always used to wish that it was Halloween, and my mom was like, no, I don't want a Halloween baby. I'm like, why? You could have sent me out to all the neighbor's houses and been like, look, they all have presents for you, and it would have been amazing <laughs> until I figured out that everybody else got presents, too, on my birthday. Yeah. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about your journey into making being a celebrant your full-time career. So you were a librarian and started doing things on the weekends. How did you, how were you able to make that transition into doing it full-time? Well, initially the original idea was, like I described my friend, the teacher, was to just have, we call it a side hustle. Do you call it a side hustle in the States? Yes. Okay, so to have this side hustle. And um, I loved it. So mm -hmm. I wanted to expand on it, but I just, I tried to be kind of cautious. And um, I went part time in the library. So it kind of, originally it was a side hustle, but then it kind of like became a part of my basically earning the same amount of money for, for a while as I had yeah. been when I was working full time in the library without the the side hustle. And that became problematic because taking funerals, I was saying no, because I couldn't mm -hmm. get the flexibility with the, the library job because without wishing to get political, we'd had some quite heavy cuts in, in that sector, meaning that they couldn't be as flexible with letting me have time off on a mm -hmm. short, on a, you know, on a short term basis, but they may have done a few years previously. So that was a tough decision. It was like, you know, you're going to take a cut in in income to be able to do more funerals. And it was kind of like a big conversation between myself and my partner. Look, our household is not going to have the steady library income. But the reality is it wasn't that much more than minimum wage for the working in the library. And mm. the hope was I would get more work if I was working full time in my well converted box room office and um, generating more, not just funerals, but also generating more naming ceremonies and funerals by dedicating almost like a nine to five in the office. That yeah. was the idea. And then a certain world event happened that <laughs> nobody expected we'd have this very grown up conversation and we knew there was going to be a drop in our income but we expected it to become eventually not only as much money as I'd ever been making working for the man yeah. um, and we still hope that that will be the case after everything is back to normal because at the moment, yeah. really, realistically, I'm only doing funerals rather than the namings and weddings. Weddings have most, all, well, all my weddings, but across the board, most weddings have been postponed. But naming ceremonies really have a finite amount of time. So 
the namings that I had booked have been cancelled, and that's heartbreaking because namings are really lovely. Yeah. I would Not just for me, that... obviously, but for the people who are having namings too. <laughs> yeah. It'd probably be more difficult to have a naming ceremony over the internet. I mean, I guess they're all kind of difficult because they're all very high-touch, human-oriented things. Yeah. But, like, I, they'd probably be a little tougher for the connection with a naming ceremony. And, of course, internet ceremonies are something we can do, and a lot of my colleagues have done them. But without exception, you know, I've postponed a lot of weddings, and I'd mentioned the idea of a Zoom ceremony, and I, there isn't really that much uptake. They're so intimate. They're so personal. And yeah. you know this well. You've you've obviously used Zoom a lot. Yes, it's functional. Yes, thank goodness it's there while we're yeah. going through this current situation. But they kind of suck. And everybody's yeah. got Zoom fatigue now, haven't they? Nine months yes. of it, and you're like, still grateful it's there. But yeah, uh, yeah. Well, and the worst part about, I think, showing up to a Zoom wedding is it's not like showing up to a Zoom call for work. You just can't do it in pajama pants. <laughs> <laughs> well, the time difference between you and me, I don't think I've, I don't think I've had a shirt on at 6 a.m. <laughs> since last year. Yeah, so I'm on the very west coast of the United States, and he's over in Manchester, England. And so it's like, what is it now? It's like 11:30 at night here, and it's what it's Good like grief. seven in the morning for you or something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's that's a tricky one to make work schedule wise. Those two countries, I can't get We're my doing head it. time zones. It drives me crazy. Yeah. I have to be told what time it is in GMT, otherwise I might turn up at the wrong time. Yes, I always just make people use my online scheduler because I have the same problem. It's like, how it's, many do I add? And like, is there like a a daylight com- savings time? It's a complete mental block to me and my idea of a nightmare. Because yeah. even before the current situation, I did do some meetings with couples online. For example, mm-hmm. one couple live in New Zealand, but they have family here. So they're actually going to have two ceremonies. And ah. so they wanted to plan a ceremony with me while they were in New Zealand and that you know it's odd but perfectly fine with me is that I would actually meet them on their wedding day (laughs) which is but so you know I have used Zoom before everything and that was fantastic when it was a luxury as opposed to a necessity you know yeah yeah for sure (laughs) yeah there's enough things that can go wrong in a wedding you don't need to have tech difficulties on your wedding day exactly (laughs) <laughs> like I say, I, I would love to do these ceremonies for people, but I really don't think, at least from my experience, people want something as intimate as a naming or a wedding via Zoom. Yeah, yeah. So talk to us a little bit about humanism. So a lot of wedding celebrants and funeral celebrants and whatever are religious in nature and mm-hmm. aligned with a certain faith. And humanism is like a an organization, but not really a faith proper. Tell us just for our listeners who aren't familiar what humanism is. It's definitely not a faith is the first thing that I'll say. Um, It is a non-religious organization. And the term atheist tells you what I'm not. And that's Mm -hmm. fine. But the term humanist tells you what I am. I am an atheist, but the term humanism highlights the positive. So I am non-religious, but I use my non-religion to make my life meaningful. I look at life from a scientific, evidence-based kind of outlook, but also because I believe that this is the one life that I have, you have to make sure that you achieve happiness as well as any kind of academic or um, work-related success. And you live your life knowing that it is the only one you have and you make it positive and full of happiness. And if I was going to put it in one sentence, it's atheism with a bit of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that like living every day to the fullest and, you know, making every day you have on this planet count is a good life lesson for anyone. It's not exclusive to humanism, you know? Yeah, for sure. So the type of clients that are attracted to you, do they tend to be fellow humanists or 
do you have a good mixture of religious people and not religious people that you work with? The thing with the term humanist is it's very much putting a flag on your mast. The vast majority of non-religious folk are agnostic or atheist because Mm -hmm. they haven't, for want of a better word, committed to humanism. I wouldn't call it that. It's just that I found a term that describes exactly who and what I am, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, So most most of my customers are likely to be agnostic or or atheist or don't know or just not religious. Mm -hmm. But the... The association with Humanists UK means that, yes, if someone identifies as humanist, they almost without exception will use the humanist celebrant. But what I do find fascinating is humanist celebrants, because of our accreditation and training being relatively well known in this country as as a, a, a seal of quality, we are used by non-religious folk who want someone neutral. Mm-hmm. We... For example, the, the the owl wedding, as I will always call it, <laughs> they were two different types of Christian and mm-hmm. their parents couldn't agree on which church to have it in. So they didn't. Yeah. They had it in a beautiful outside setting in Milan. And mm. they brought in me again because the same problem. Which vicar do you have? Yeah. So what they got from me was a non-religious ceremony that was just as meaningful to them because sure they may have lost some of the religious elements but they got a lot more of we've got this marketing campaign your wedding your way and that's exactly what they got they got to do elements like the owl like the musician that they couldn't really have or would have found it very difficult to do with a religious uh, equivalent of what I did Mm -hmm. for them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of different churches have rules about music and dancing and what kind of attire you can wear. And I imagine that it's nice to have the opportunity to kind of get out from underneath that if you wanted to. Um, Do you ever have, has, have people ask you to incorporate religious type things into ceremonies that you've done? And if so, how do you handle those kind of requests? Okay. So There isn't a consensus amongst humanist celebrants. Some celebrants will say, no, this is a non-religious ceremony. But I feel personally an important part of my humanism is a belief in equality and inclusion. So, yes, if you want a, a religious element as part of your ceremony, the answer is yes. But I am not religious and it would be, I feel it would be disrespectful and hypocritical for me to, for example, read the Lord's Prayer at a funeral. So yes, you can have a religious element, but if you want that, then I would ask you to find someone to do that. So Uncle Dave can come up and read the Lord's Prayer at the funeral. Um, Your dad can come and read a, a passage from the Bible at your wedding, that sort of thing. And I feel like that's kind of like a happy compromise really because yeah I don't want to come across as I I I can't get my head around the idea of a a room with some religious folk in basically lying to them that I believe in their god I don't Mm -hmm. think that would be a nice thing to do but I also want them to feel included and have their important aspects of the ceremony there as well yeah Yeah, and I think there is some, uh, in addition to the lying thing, like you don't want to just treat their holy books passages like their literature, like some colleges try and treat religious books. Like, I I appreciate that you try and show more respect to whatever their beliefs are Mm. by like kind of emceeing them through the process and helping (laughs) them to find somebody that will take care of that and you just bring them up at the appropriate time. Mm Mm-hmm. So talk to us a little bit about money. <laughs> so a lot I of like religious, it. right? It's great. <laughs> it's green in some countries, your country. It's a lot more colorful. Do you know what? <laughs> I, I do like it, but I don't like it as much as some people. I think you wouldn't do, <laughs> you wouldn't do my job if you wanted to be a millionaire. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you like a lot of religious people doing 
various types of spiritual oriental practices uh, feel awkward about charging for them. I would imagine because it's like kind of culturally accepted that you're going to pay the dude that like, you know, hosts your wedding, that you don't struggle with that as much. But do you ever have like pricing pushback or feel weird about charging a certain amount or over a certain amount for your services? Honestly, I put what I charge on my website. And so Mm. people, before they've even dropped me an email, know what they're paying and what they're paying for. And yeah, it's an unpleasant thing to talk about when it comes Mm -hmm. to money. But if you think about someone's wedding, the amount I charge, you're probably going to play more you're probably going to pay more for your flowers than you are for me. Yes. Or in a particular, well, maybe I'm exaggerating, but not by much. Your venue, my fee is a drop in the ocean in comparison to that. And I believe you really do get value for money for what you get for what mm-hmm. I charge. Mm-hmm. So you don't, you haven't had that like personal, like you, you feel very comfortable these are what I, these are the prices I charge. Like you don't feel like you get a lot of pushback. You're, you're comfortable. I think anybody who runs their own business gets a lot of pushback, don't they? Yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, I've, you know, if someone says, Oh, that's a lot. I would just explain to them again, how many hours I put into this travel and like, everything, you know, I, I don't have hidden fees or anything like that. What yeah. I tell you and what I agree with you, even if, I don't know, for example, there, there aren't any, there isn't really a way for me to incur unforeseen costs in what I do. But if there were, mm-hmm. I wouldn't then add that to my fee. When I, when we've agreed a price, we've agreed a price. And unless you live a significant distance away, it's always the same. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So talk to me about how customized your ceremonies are. Do you kind of have like a couple standard options that people can pick from? Or is it like fully custom built for each person from the ground up? Well, naming ceremonies and weddings are very different to funerals. Mm -hmm. Funerals, particularly if you're having your funeral in a crematorium, which the majority of British people do, you get a 20 minute time slot. So you are restricted Mm by how much I can say in 20 minutes. Yeah. Other than that, you can do what you like. The, the, a recent funeral I did, I loved it. The family wanted it to be lighthearted. And um, the, the gentleman who had died was always late. So I worked <laughs> with the funeral director to have his coffin turn up late. So uh, what, what do you call a coffin in America? Casket. A coffin, yeah. To have his uh, casket yeah, turn up too. late. At his own funeral. That's that's hilarious. And it was brilliant. And it got a laugh. But it, well, it was a gentle laugh that got everyone into kind of the idea that, yes, this is a somber event, but we're going to allow it to have an element of lightheartedness because this is who this man was. He wouldn't want yes. you to sit there like this. Because yeah. he never would have accepted that in his home. So, yeah. you know, we, we can make it as, as bespoke as you want. Within 20 minutes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Whereas weddings and namings, you've got a little bit more flexibility on time scale. And um, I've always been surprised by, I think, at least to begin with, I was surprised by, well, what do you think, Mark? No, no, this is your wedding. You yeah. can have what you want. And people would take a step back and kind of let it sink in. Because they had only really seen, in a lot of cases, religious weddings in a church or wherever. Mm -hmm. So in their head, they had this time scale. They had how the process goes. And I find it fascinating how you can see what people's expectations of a wedding are, regardless of the fact that they've come to me. And then... You kind of see the cogs ticking as they think, right, so I could have this, I could have this, I could have this. And of course, you know, I can always come with my experience and suggest some symbolic gestures you might like to do if you're if you're struggling to think. And um, I'll always share things off on Etsy. And I've got like a collection of readings that I like 
But these are readings that I like. They're only ever suggestions. You want anything at your wedding. You can have it. You know, I've had mm -hmm. people. The best one I had was um, I had a wedding on the Saturday and a funeral the following Tuesday. And both the wedding and the funeral ended with the same music. Oh, wow. You've got a friend in me from Toy Story. Oh, wow. And suddenly you see, suddenly you see how it's apt for both. Yeah. But you never thought that that would ever be a thing. And just by pure coincidence, I went and, and I was like, wow, brilliant. It's yeah. a lovely song as well. Yes. Yeah. I love that guy's voice. Mm. Mm hmm. So you talk about uh, in your health safety uh, statement on your website, you explicitly say that you're not able to offer any personal comfort or physical contact at this time. And I would imagine for somebody in your line of work, that's like, I mean, what you're celebrating is humanness and the cycle of humanness, that that's really tough for you. How have you handled that? It's awful. You know, yeah. it, it's it's perfect human nature if you believe that the celebrant or the priest or whoever's done the ceremony has done a good job. You want to mm -hmm. shake that person's hand. And yeah. obviously, I, that's a massive compliment to me is, thank you very much, that was great, hand out, shake their hand. And that's natural human behaviour. Mm -hmm. You know, 41 years of polite british tea drinking handshakes you know <laughs> and it's such an unnatural thing to kind of go thank you i can't shake your hand yeah it feels again british people and rudeness it feels so rude to not yeah. take someone's hand when they offer it but of course everybody understands mm -hmm. of course everybody understands you, you you shouldn't be touching each other you um Initially, this wasn't the case, but it was changed. You have to wear a mask as you go into the crematorium, but you can take it off at the um, once, you, once you're at the front. Mm. But everybody else, all the mourners, still have to wear a mask in in British crematoriums. I'm not sure what the case is in America at the moment, but we, the only person who takes their mask off during the ceremony is the celebrant or the priest or whoever's taking the ceremony. And that's an added extra of unpleasantness for the people attending the funeral. And you're supposed to social distance. Yeah. You can only, you, you don't have to if, if you're in the same household. So, you know, yeah. the husband and wife can sit next to each other. But if their son or daughter lives outside of their home, they have to social distance at a funeral. Yeah, the and time when you need the most human touch in your life. Everybody understands why and everybody does their very best to respect it but how much more difficult is that and yeah. if I'm whining about not being able to shake someone's hand imagine how much worse it is for people attending the funeral and then of course there's the limitations on the number of people that can turn up yeah. imagine the stress on a family who has yep. to go okay so you can come you can come but you I'm sorry you can't come yeah Yes, yeah, so I much just politics. It's it's not it's it's just I don't know if it's even politics. It's just sad that you have to go through a list of people that want to come to your loved one's funeral and pick your top 15. It's yeah, such an impossible situation for everybody. So, yeah, it's unpleasant for me, but it doesn't even scratch the surface compared to the people that are actually a attending and organizing the funeral of someone that they've lost. Yeah, for sure. Well, moving on to a more happy, <laughs> happy topic, let's talk about your podcast a little bit. So you interview different people that have had ceremonies or that are going to, or, or how do you pick who you're going to interview for your show? Honestly, I picked, initially the idea was that it was an opportunity for me to mark, have a, like a unique marketing point for my business and catch up with with people that I know and like. And the whole concept was that I would go around their house for a brew. Sorry, cup of mm -hmm. tea. Very British, northern British <laughs> term there for you. Go around their house for a brew and nice. sit down for an hour and have a conversation about things that are relevant to my job and mm -hmm. put it on the internet once a fortnight. 
the current situation has meant that I've had to change the majority of it to online recording. So I've been approaching basically people who are confident with that, podcasters and um, people that have not necessarily I would have approached uh, as early as this. I'm about, I think I'm 16 episodes in now. And Mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that were I able to go around the house for a brew, I would have recorded with by now but I haven't and I'm waiting until normality returns so that I can go around the house and drink tea and be very mm-hmm. British and then have a uh, conversation about naming ceremonies, weddings and funerals. Uh, what I like about the podcast is that it kind of, again, like the term life cycle, it goes through the whole lot and it talks about what you've had, what you want. And the, the, the part I, I, I don't know whether this would have been the case. I I never would have thought this would be the case, but I really like asking people what readings and what music they would like at their funeral, because I think Mm. it kind of beyond the fact that it's fascinating to learn about people's music taste and people's taste in poetry and prose. You can listen to my podcast if that person dies and know exactly what they wanted for their funeral. And it's, it, it, it will make it, easier for the families of anybody that I have on the podcast right (laughs) so what about you what would be the music and or readings that you would want in your in your case in your funeral I'm absolutely certain about the music and um when you leave my when you leave the crematorium after my ceremony you will be coming out to the show must go on by queen Oh, which wow. um so it it kind of I just feel like it's apt that I've I've been you know I've been I've worked as someone in in front of crowds for a huge amount of time during my life and I, it just feels right that the sentiment of that song is yes it's sad yeah. but it's time for the show to go on you know yeah and um for the the, you know the, the the peaceful time where you're given uh, t- time to think and uh, and pause. I'm I'm a rocker dude. I've always been a rocker dude. And um, leave out all the rest by Linkin Park is a surprisingly good song for that. If you actually, mm. it's not heavy, but it's definitely rock. And it, yeah. but the the lyrics are so beautiful. And a friend of mine. Were, he was a wrestler and it, there was a tribute video to him that used that track and ever since then I was like I it's have to have this song for my funeral you know mm-hmm. yeah and you wouldn't think Linkin Park would be appropriate for a funeral is there is there appropriate for funerals I mean there's like I guess kind of but <laughs> that was the point I was about to make exactly right have what you want. It's your funeral. And yeah. I've had some wonderful choices. I've had the theme tune from Friends. I've had the theme tune from Coronation Street. And it wasn't mine. I wish it was. But I know another celebrant who had a biker's funeral. And um, Bat Out of Hell was, was his choice. Oh, I was going to guess Highway <laughs> to Hell. But yeah, same same kind of thing. <laughs> Ring of Fire is another one that people have had when they've been in the crematorium. It's like, oh my. but you can have what you want. You can have what you yeah. want. Well, you know, I, I, I said earlier, you can have, you've got a friend in me from Toy Story. Whatever, whatever is appropriate to the person, bespoke and unique, just like everybody else thinks you yeah. were. Awesome. So what is like the most like how how has this changed you as a person being a life cycle celebrant I feel like the time in my life where I chose to become a celebrant was key Mm -hmm. uh you know at 40 you've got you've got the life experience and the gravitas yeah but you've still got relative youth Mm-hmm. To be a very dynamic and uh, full of life celebrant for people. Yeah. There aren't many celebrants younger than me. And from a sports MC background, 
I was always the oldster in the locker room because I was the announcer. And it, yeah. that's, that's flipped it. There are, obviously, there are some younger celebrants than me. And I think there are some brilliant celebrants in their 20s and 30s that provide something very different and very unique. But I feel like I picked the right time for me personally. Um, without wishing to go too much into my personal life, I, I came out in my 20s, which meant I was perhaps a little bit behind everybody else on a maturity level when I first started to grasp the concept of who I am. Mm. Um, so for me, I had already done all the changing I needed to, to pick the right time to be a celebrant, I think is probably the best way to answer that question, which I mm. realize isn't answering that question. Sorry. No, it is. And I, that's a, that's a good perspective. It's like the timing was right. It was your next stage of like personal evolution. Like it totally makes sense. I think also, again, at 40 with a stable household with my partner and the cat, um, we, it was the right time to take a risk. If it all went mm. to pot, and I'd given it a good go for a couple of years. I could like walk away saying, I gave it a good go. It was something I wanted to do. I'm going to have to go back to it being a side hustle and I'll get a, and I'll get another job. Yeah. Obviously, sure. we didn't plan for the current situation, but yes, I, well, I still don't the, regret it. Even with the current situation, I don't know how it is in the UK, but over here, a lot of the libraries shut down. So you yeah. may have been, you know, but, uh, sitting at home anyways. I'd have been furloughed in Britain. And, um, That's true. The furlough system gives you 80% of your salary to sit on your backside and watch Netflix. So, yes. you know, I'd have had that comfortable income and yeah. I'd have been able to watch Netflix. So, um, you know, I, w I wouldn't have minded that. Right. Uh, so as, as timing goes, it wasn't ideal, but it is still something that I'm pleased that I did, you know? Yeah. Sometimes you just have to jump and, like, use whatever happens as, like, fuel for your fire and, and it's... Mm. It becomes part of your business, how it goes in the future. And just kind of got to value those in hindsight after you're through them. Mm. So what drives you to be an entrepreneur? What is it about having your own business that's especially meaningful to you? Oh, I'm a terrible entrepreneur. <laughs> I'm terrible <laughs> at it. I'm, I'm, I'm a committed humanist and I'm a capable celebrant. I'm a terrible entrepreneur. And I'm not well, sure that's something that I'm ashamed of either. Uh, if friends ask me to do a wedding, I will probably give them a discount if they ask. If friends are watching, no, I won't. Um, <laughs> no discounts. Um, Except you, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm terrible for it. I um, Weddings and naming ceremonies, you set your own price. Whereas in Britain, funeral directors basically control the price of a of a celebrant and or any other efficient vicar or imam or rabbi whatever they might use depending on the people's faith and um and, and at no point am i criticizing anybody else for what they do but you're much more likely to get a more time consuming amount of work from me writing a funeral from scratch compared to perhaps a more traditional vicar who has a lot of religious element that they use every day yeah. and might just put in a little bit of personalization that that the com comparable amount of writing is 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 less work than me but th th that's a simple fact but i get paid the same as a vicar for a ceremony in um, yeah. in, in by, by a funeral director but again like i said before you, i i wouldn't be in this job if i was in it for the money the money yeah. is enough to keep me going, doing a job that I feel is ethical and I really, really enjoy. So now I'm a terrible entrepreneur. I, I, I like the idea of being able to say I'm an entrepreneur, but I, I'm, I know who I am and, and, and what I'm capable of. And um, no, I'm not very good at that. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> You'll grow into it and you're happy. Like, well, I guess that's the first question in the rapid fire questions, which we're at that part of the show now. So I have a couple of rapid fire questions. You can take as long as you need to answer them. You don't have to do one word answers, but they start okay. with, are you happy? As happy as can be in the current situation. Yes. Mm -hmm. As a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Teacher. Interesting. What kind of teacher? English teacher. I um I have an English degree, 
Mm-hmm. And I failed a PGCE, which is the qualification to convert your degree into being able to teach. And um, that wasn't a nice time in my life. So uh, <laughs> I, uh-huh. I think I have found my calling now. But for 20 years between failing that and, um, and, and, and coming to being a celebrant, I was just kind of like doing jobs that I didn't hate, but I didn't love. Yeah. And there are much yeah. people in much worse situations than that. People who work jobs they hate because they have to. So, you know, I've, I've done okay. But when you explicitly fail at something that you'd wanted to do ever since you were five, that's a knock, you know? Yeah, yeah. I guess it's one of those things, though, in retrospect, like all of the skills that you acquired along the way with the emceeing and, yeah. you know, in the library like and your English background like your prose is probably so much better than somebody that didn't have that that background and you have all this like richness of literature that you can draw quotes from that somebody who didn't study that might not have the same access to so you know that that path did lead lead you to where you are and and you picked up a lot of valuable things along the way there's a very unpleasant saying I don't know if it's transferred to the states is if you have an arts degree and you tell someone who has a um, an engineering or a science background, if they're an unpleasant person, they'll say to you, do you want fries with that? Yeah, Suggesting no. that you spent three years at university for a piece of paper that means you'll end up working in a fast food restaurant. Yeah. And no, I would argue very... He- yeah, okay, fair enough. But I would argue very heavily that there are transferable skills, which I have very much used throughout my life I wouldn't even in the library when someone says do you know about a book on this or a book for this age group or whatever I had that knowledge because I'd went to university and read a lot of books you know but beyond that yes you're right the prose and the language skills that I learned through my degree are critical for what I do now yeah yeah you know one of my top, I think it's my most valuable life lesson that I've picked up over the course of my entire life. I learned from an art class that I took when I was in college. And it it was basically, there was an assignment and he gave like three rules and that was it. And then everybody pretty much in the whole class, like stuck with all these other rules that they perceived to be there or that you thought the teacher's expectations were. And he like graded people according to the three rules and people started to get upset because they assumed that they had to have all these other things. And the life lesson was only abide by the rules they actually give you. Don't assume there's extra rules. And that applies yeah. to so many different things in life. Like, I like that. It, it gives you so much freedom because you make all these rules for yourself or you have all these societal expectations that are un, unsaid. But like, no, if you stick by the, the tiny rules that exist in life and then do your own thing from there. Mm. I agree yeah. with that completely. One of my favorite. I think I'd have liked that teacher. Oh, he was so amazing. I wish he would have taught every class that I took in college. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the rapid fire questions. What keeps you up at night? Uh, in, insomnia. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I tend to go to bed when I'm tired, so I don't think any, anything can keep me up. I've always been a massive night owl, so... I'm much more yes. comfortable going to bed at 2 a.m. than I am at 10, um, yeah. which is perfect when you've got an appointment at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, no, I had the same thing because I'm a night owl and I had an early appointment this morning as well. And it's just, <laughs> oh, my goodness. I swear I stay up to the second that my eyes won't stay up anymore. Like mm. <laughs> they won't stay open. I work so best you- at night. Last night, yeah. last night, knowing I got this at six o'clock in the morning, or I was up at six o'clock in the morning for this, uh, I, I did my tax return last night till 2 a.m. <laughs> nice, nice. But yeah, I've worked I, best I'm... at night, always have, always have. Write, writing um, weddings till midnight is my norm, you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. No, I do the same thing with websites I'm designing or branding I'm designing for clients. Same thing. I actually have an interview with a doctor in two days. And one of the things I'm going to talk to her about is, you know, you hear it's so unhealthy to be a night owl, but is it really? So we'll both have to pay attention to what she says. I don't in look her bad interview. for 42, right? I haven't right? ruined myself too much by being a night owl. Yeah. I don't think. 
bit of gray yeah. in the beard, but you know, not too <laughs> Everybody. bad. Everybody, I know, I have my share of grays too, but yeah, <laughs> nobody can see them in this lighting. It's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Wait, if it's lighting, I've got a full head of hair. Right? Yes, yeah. it's entirely lighting. Oh yeah. <laughs> If you could change one thing about your business right now, aside from the current situation. <laughs> ah, you knew what I was going right? to say. Right? What would it be? Um, I don't know. I, I, I would like funeral directors to pay by bank transfer rather than check. Okay. I haven't seen a check in 10 years. <laughs> Right. I what don't know why check? they do it, but it's it's like a tradition and like they they very kind of tr- traditional and kind of old school. A lot of funeral directors and yeah. they they do this little ritual where they kind of like hand you your check out of the way of the family. I'm like, just bank transfer it. You've got right? a bank account. <laughs> we don't, don't have know to be why sneaky. they do it. Maybe I've missed something. Maybe there's some kind of tradition or ritual element that I don't get I hope not right. because I, I you know I, I, I think it's just habit and um yeah. just, just 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 pay me my bank transfer <laughs> update yourself to the 21st and a half century <laughs> so what are your goals for the next one to five years or so the same as it was when I left my job in January is to give it a go Mm-hmm. and try and make a sustainable business that pays me more than I ever earned working in a library or as a PA with my own rules and my own hours. That's all I've ever wanted since I started doing this. Awesome. So what's your dream? <laughs> uh, this with a uh, cat sanctuary. Okay, nice. So are they like feral cat sanctuary or what kind of cats are at your sanctuary? Don't matter. Just cats. Just All cats. the cats. Many, nice. many cats. Many, many <laughs> cats. And a, and a nice, I mean, I, I currently live um, less than a mile outside of Manchester city centre, which is cool. And it's great being that close to this incredible hub of creativity and humanity and uh, nice bars. But um I think the dream is to move a little bit further out, have a nice big house that costs half the rent with a cattery attached to it, you know? That's awesome. That's a great dream. I so like cats. It... <laughs> it takes a certain kind of per- My best friend is a cat person as well, so I'm surrounded by you people. <laughs> <laughs> so if you uh, had to recommend certain practices to help other people make their lives more meaningful, what would some of your recommendations be? Live like a humanist. Um, Treat it like it's the only life that you have and make it count, make it full of joy, make it busy. Don't waste your time. You don't need to be humanist to behave like that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Tell our listeners where they can find more about you on the interwebs. So if you want to find my website, it is www. Oh, I'm so old. You don't need the www. <laughs> if you want to find my website, it's humanist.org.uk forward slash Mark Adams. That's my name, M-A-R-K-A-D-A-M-S. On Twitter and Instagram, it's at Mark Adams H-C. You can also find my podcast on Twitter as well, at Life's Milestones. Awesome. And of course, all of that will be in the description wherever you're listening uh, to this podcast or watching this video. Thanks so much for being on the show today. You're more than welcome. I've had a lovely time. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks. Thanks.